I'm very happy to welcome you here in Thank our you. offices in Graz, in Austria. Um, Professor Lars Montelius is our special guest this year at our networking event here in Graz. And we are very honored to have you here. So the first, of course, is that people should get to know you. Mm -hmm. So I would kindly ask you to talk a little bit about your background, mm -hmm. about your um, expertise and mm -hmm. what you bring with you to this nice event. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, um, I, uh, I have been working on nanotechnology more or less my whole life, more or less directly after my PhD. So we were very early on at the Lund University, where I'm affiliated to, and we were principally three places in the world. It was in Lund, it was in California, and it was in Japan, at the Riken Institute and the UCLA in, in California. And we kind of started more or less together, trying to speak about why is nanotechnology important. And at that point in time, I met a lot of people saying, you know, isn't this just physics or mm -hmm. Chemistry, we have been working on nanotechnology all our whole lives, but it was completely different. There was something new, a new dimension. Mm -hmm. So it was a rather interesting time in the beginning. So this is in the, let's say, this is in the end of 80s. Right? Mm -hmm. So we had the very first programs in 87 uh, by the Swedish research agency. Mm -hmm. And then we have been ongoing working on that. And my education is in, I'm an electronic engineer as my Master of Science, mm -hmm. but then I'm a physicist, a solid state physicist, as my PhD degree. And then I've been working primarily on the interface between, let's say, physics, electronics, and medical technologies, biotechnologies. So okay. these have been my scope, so to say. Although I have a rather strong passion for, uh, let's say, technology development, mm -hmm. including scanning probe lithography. Mm -hmm. So I spent my postdoc at IBM in York and working on. AFM, atomic force microscopes, and were part of the very first atomic imaging of sodium chloride at that point in time, which was 1980, 1988, oh, I think it was. Yeah. So, uh, and then things have moved on, of course. And then uh, with the further developments um, within the university, I got more and more important tasks, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, I was leading the Urzun Science Region and Urzun University, mm -hmm. which is a cooperation of 14 universities in Sweden and Denmark, and the ministries and the research agencies. Rather complicated. More people in the board than people working yeah. in the field. But fantastic. But then, uh, some years ago, I was approached by INL, the International or the Intergovernmental <laughs> Nanotechnology Laboratory headquartered in Praga, and they said, shouldn't you? Wouldn't you be interested to be the director general for this? And then I went there and said, wow, this would be a real nice uh, challenge. So I've been there now eight years and, uh, as director general, and I, I, I stopped that in, uh, in August last year. Mm -hmm. And now I'm formerly a, a professor emeritus at the Lund University, but I'm rather engaged with many different things. I've started about 10 different companies in Sweden as well. I'm wow. engaged with some international companies also. So there is quite a, quite a lot of things to do. So from very fundamental research and science, yes. you went through the several different stations mm -hmm. um, in the development stage, mm -hmm. then to develop like INL, really mm -hmm. huge research centers as well. Right. right. And finally, of course, creating companies. So mm -hmm. bringing the things to the market. Yeah. And um, how many of these companies are in the nano field? They are more or less everyone, but it, it well, mm -hmm. I mean, you can, you can speak about it from the kind of fundamental level, so yeah. to say, and then the applied level, right? So they are applying in the, let's call it real world, if you like, but it's using nanotechnology in order to actually mm -hmm. do that. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It's amazing. And of course, um, nanomaterials, as we know, more or less per definition, is one of the parts of this specific kind of advanced materials, um, special properties, special mm -hmm. things we expect mm -hmm. from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there comes now this um, advanced materials initiative, mm -hmm. which of course is very much linked to your name. Um, mm -hmm. And this why, yeah, it would be very interesting. How relates your role now? I mean, from your background, it's more, mm -hmm. more or less clear, but 
how came then the idea to be there for creating this initiative, this Army right. 2030? Yeah. I mean, there is a challenge with, uh, let's say, nanotechnology or all advanced materials. Right? Mm -hmm. So both are kind of suffering from when you speak about the people like politicians that do not really understand what it is. So if you speak about uh, digital communication or artificial intelligence, they may have a, some kind of feeling what it is. But when you speak about nanotechnology, I'm also a terrorist. Mm. I don't really get it, so to say. So I think there is a need to engage, of course, yeah. but there's also a need to, let's say, connect the different dots. Mm. Because the materials, I mean, a whole our, well, every society relies on our ability to master materials. We had the Stone Age, we had the Bronze Age, we had the Silicon Age. Now we're living in an age where we actually can tailor material properties, more or less atom by atom or molecule by molecule, not by chance, but by precision. Yeah. So we are living in a, and this has been, I would say, a development over the maybe the last 50 years or so, which has been tremendous. Right? But now the next decade, we need to speed up a bit, and then we can, then we need to do innovations that are kind of unified if we like, mm. right? because in the past every kind of innovation was taking, was done in each sector. And that takes about 30, 40 years to yeah. do that. But now I think we need to work together. And I have one, one interesting, I mean, just example for that. So there has been a lot of discussion about interdisciplinary research. Yeah. The most often used way is that there is a scientist in one subject that is maybe saying, mm, I'm doing something that could be maybe be of, let's say, medical interest. Mm -hmm. So I contact some at the medical faculty, and then you can hijack that person's abilities to help you. Yeah. And then what happens with this guy over here? Well, he gets more, he or she gets more things to do, right? because it's a little bit peripheral to what they do by themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's not really interdisciplinary. It is using other people's discipline, which is nice. Yeah. But it's not really moving together forward. And I think this is what we try to aim with the, with the AIMI 2030 initiative, is to bring people together, to do things together that will be beneficial for everyone, mm -hmm. not only for one hijacking the subject or someone else. Um, I see the point. Um, right. This is exactly what I would so also relate with the nano safety, nanotoxicology, mm -hmm. <laughs> nanotechnology in general. Right. Um, on the one hand, and characterization items, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. use of data, mm -hmm. um, all these aspects, right. uh, and of course they are addressed in AMI 2030 uh, in of specific course. parts. Yeah. So at the end, um, nanoscience, nanotechnology will feed into the AMI 2030 part. I think so. I mean, you, you can call nanotechnology being a sub part if you like, but I think yeah. it's, more, it's more horizontal in a way. I think it mm -hmm. touches on all kinds of different things. Yeah. But in the end, it's about our ability to tailor material with a certain specific function on intention yeah. to design a material that will actually end up in a product or a service in the market. Yeah. And I think this ability to do that is the kind of core of this. And we need to, we need to speed up the development mm -hmm. because we are, in Europe, we are good when it comes to advanced materials manufacturing. And we are good on some topics, but we are not really good on other topics. And we are kind of moving away from having a leading position in the world. So we need mm -hmm. to speed up. And one way to speed up is really to work together. I mean, there is this old, old saying that if you would like to get something done very quickly, do it yourself. But if you yeah. would like to go, come far, go far, do it together with others. And I think that's why we, what that's why we need to work together. Yeah. Yeah, this collaborative item on of doing it together for more value generated by all of them, not only for the one or the other, right. it's very interesting and good. Um, which brings me to the materials innovation markets. Mm -hmm. Which one do you think is most influenced as we come from the nano field, mm -hmm. from the nano science, from the nanotechnology? Well, uh, this is a difficult question because principally I think it kind of touch on everyone, right? But mm -hmm. I think there is innovation markets, let's say, in the med tech, in the health, yeah. which is, will have a very big importance for the future. So mm -hmm. our health kind of system needs to 
we need to change the, the pyramid in a way. We need to be much more predictive mm -hmm. maintenance of our bodies and mm -hmm. having natural system and, and data collection that actually makes us to do the right thing yeah. rather than getting sick and then get uh, the cure to, to, to cure it, so to, yeah. say, uh, to stay healthy. It's easy to say, and of course, it's very difficult to do in, in reality. But I think we need to put emphasis on that and really use the digitalization, the data that can be generated uh, so we, 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 we can change the kind of health system as, it, as we see it, because it will be too costly. Yeah. So the interconnection between the data um, and the application of the data, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, common ontologies, all these parts, mm -hmm. seems to be a crucial part. It is a crucial part, and I think ontology is, is it's, it's a nice word, so to say, but it's all about how to, how to aggregate and use data in the best possible way. Right. And we need to we need to believe, or we need to understand that we're living in the high performance computing time, in the artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. We have the chatbots coming out, so we need to do this machine learning and not do the old fashioned way that we put data in certain boxes with certain names on it. Yeah. I mean, there is no real reason to do that, right? But we are kind of fostered to do that. We put our socks in one drawer and our clothes in another drawer, other clothes. But we don't need that when you have the accessibility and the computation power. So we could have everything disorganized, but when we, when we need it, we get it. The red socks will come yeah. when I ask for them, right? So it's the same thing for materials and the data, that we need a better connectivity. There has to be interchangeability, of course, interoperability between different databases. But then we need to search in the databases using artificial intelligence. Otherwise, we will not be able to do it. For this, it will need a specific kind of skills and people for yeah. that. Which are yeah. the, the most let's say, needed one, which mm -hmm. would say, you could already identify throughout the last years now? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the whole generation of people, I mean, now the, 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 let's go, the young generation of today, they're really, they're looking for meaningfulness. Yeah. And it could not think, nothing could be more meaningful than put your efforts into material science because it would change society. Mm -hmm. It would pave the way for a total green society mm -hmm. without any carbon footprints, really resi resilient society. Mm -hmm. And I think here there is a chance, of course, to have a lot of reskilling of all the people in the field, but also to skill the new people to actually understand how they can contribute. And I think the, it's the connectivity between different things. So you need to be specialist somewhere, but then it's the connectivity of, let's say, the AI or the machine learning together with the deep sciences and the deep knowledge in different fields. And yeah. you need to be a, a connector, let's call it like that. Right? So I, I, I like to see this like, like, like a world map with different competences in different boxes. And in between, a lot of white spots or so light white fields, and we only know maybe 100, so the total area is mapped. And all the other 99% is unknown. Mm. And if you reach out and start to move in these white areas, you will actually take the first steps, yeah. instead of going in other people's foot, foot parts. Right? So you take the first steps, and here you create the innovation. So the innovation is in the interfaces, mm -hmm. and the interfaces may not be immediate, I mean, it could be a, a big area in between. But it's really to try to find these white spots where there is a lot of invention power mm -hmm. that may lead to innovation. This brings me to the part that at the end, um, a systemic change is needed to mm -hmm. be able to implement it, mm -hmm. which means some governance structures need to right. be rethought. Yeah. Um, what groups of stakeholders do you think are the crucial ones mm -hmm. along that road? Who yeah. have the responsibilities and mm -hmm. who will? bring some pressure to it, let's right, say, like that. Right, right. I mean, if you read the AME manifesto that was done a year ago about, then it was very clear that it's for all stakeholders. Yeah. So we need to connect. It's not only about, let's say, the deep science people, not only the people in the industry, but also the people on the MS street. I mean, the, we as citizens yeah. need to be there, right? Because we need to, and of course, this is very complicated. It's easy to say, but it's more complicated to make. But I think it's a necessity, and it's not about outreaching activities in the usual way. It's really to make inclusiveness, to make discussions, dialogues, invite people to be part, because we need to stop to make too many silly products. Yeah. 
but we don't need the kind of flashing things in the garden in during Christmas. It's not necessary, yeah. but there are a lot of things we need to do, and if we do correctly with some kind of a sustainable passport or something, yeah. we're using legit technologies, so we don't need to put marks on things, but it, it's really there, then we could actually do much more sustainable, so we mm -hmm. avoid doing things, and that will be, of course, more jobs, mm -hmm. more possibilities for people, and then the society will prosper. So there is nothing to be sustainable doesn't mean that you cannot have prosperity. So I think you can do that and you mm -hmm. can develop. Sometimes this is mix max by people saying that if you do everything sustainable, then you cannot continue to develop society. But I don't think, I think that is just. Um, the word of meaningfulness you just mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to come back to that. I think this is a crucial one. And it's also in the core of the Army 2030, of course, mm -hmm. um, which would bring us to, okay, which skills, which disciplines mm -hmm. um, can support and in which way to create meaningful things mm -hmm. for the future? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, this is an excellent question, right? And meaningfulness is very important. And I think the, the aspiration of Army 2030 is really about that, mm -hmm. aspire the meaningfulness as that the glue for connecting, so to say. Yeah. And I think this connecting glue means that we need to connect with people having different kind of knowledge. So I don't think we can kind of deselect something and say, we don't need that, because we need everything. So it's, it's a little like when you're building a society, you need someone that is good on making something with him, or you need someone that can uh, repair the, uh, your teeth or something. So you build a society with different kind of, and this is the same thing here. And I think here Europe has a chance to actually build something together, because we are united and we have a lot of shared values in Europe that we could use and then bring everything together and then also to 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 connect in, in, in new ways because it's a little like I mean there are two two things like shareholders capitalism and stakeholders capitalism. So this is much more stakeholders capitalism. It should be beneficial for everyone. It doesn't mean it's not beneficial for the shareholders because they are needed of course to put emphasis and put expenditures, etc., etc., and to create new companies with new jobs, etc. So it's a need for having a really good dialogue and connection. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This brings me perfectly to this question also for the future. People need to go somewhere in their career. Yeah. Um, is it, the principle is okay, it needs to be meaningful. Um, the connectivity of the disciplines is important. So which disciplines, mm -hmm. new guys, new uh, young researchers uh, should go for? Which disciplines do you think are the key for our future? Yeah, well, I think that there are, some, I would say everyone, right? So I think the, the most important thing here is to be open to, let's say, the new avenues in life, right? So yeah. I usually have the two important questions in life. Who am I? And I don't mean professor. I mean, who am I as a person? And what do I want? These are the only two important questions and to seek new knowledge and to be afraid, not to be afraid of going out of your comfort zone and meet with other people, discuss with them, talk to them, ask questions. That will create your own learning, but also bring learning to others. So this connection, go out and look for the white spots where people have not been passing by yet, where you can find the new invented things. It's easy to say, more difficult in reality, but I think you need to strive to do that. So I think every every subject is of interest, right? I mean, there is no subject that we're studying that we don't need. So we need it, but we need to connect. And of course, we cannot connect everything. There is no need to connect everything at the same time. There is a kind of a time axis that makes different things to be connected along that time axis. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect um, step forward to my last, uh, one mm -hmm. of the last questions. Um, tomorrow we celebrate a networking event. Mm -hmm. um, BNN has one of its part, a network, mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned so often the connectivity, the interaction right. is so important. Yeah. So may I ask you the, the question, mm. we are very honored that you're coming here to our event. Mm. What was the um, reason that you selected, okay, this is event, or I will be personally there, mm -hmm. because you have so many um, commitments around and mm. Um, this would be really good to know. Well, I think, I mean, I've, I've, 
I have been in contact with BioNanoNet for, for a long time in many different kind of conferences and organizations. I've never been here. So I wanted to come here and see how it really works because I think the networking is really key for the future because we need places where people start to talk with each other. And it could be very small, start to be a very small thing and create something very big out of that. So I think the networking is essential. And I think this is something that more and more people should be interacting with. I think. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to being here. Thank you very much, Lars. I think that's a very, very nice answer also for us. It makes our work meaningful as well. Mm. Yes. Um, mm. One final question I want to give you, also mm. a short one, um, which would be quite interesting. What is your motto? What is your, um, let's say, life motto? Mm. I think the life, well, life motto is to, let's say, always, <laughs> always see the possibilities. Because there are always kind of, let's say, problems coming up, right? But you need to see the possibilities beside that. So I had one, one episode when I was the dean at the, phys at the physics department in Lund, and then it was all, I mean, at old universities, there are always a lot of problems. But when you find a problem, it's like lifting up a stone, and then you see all the things moving around there in, 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 in nature. And then I said, well, you have two choices. Either you put it down and say, I didn't see it, or you try to do something about it. And I think we need to do something about it. So my motto is really to, okay, get engaged, make things better, and be enthusiastic about it. And also to see the possibilities instead of saying, well, this is so complicated, we cannot do that. Hmm? Turn it around, make it, it an advantage instead. That's, I think that's a great uh, conclusion for, for our interview. Thank you once again, Lars. Thank it you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you for you listening. And see you tomorrow at our networking event.